as far as I know, and as far as Nielsen describes, Selfridge didn't mention neurons in his description of the pandemonium, but interestingly, its architecture is very similar to an idea that will soon have a tremendous impact on the field, which is that of the perceptron or a artificial neural network. So here is an image of the inventor of the perceptron, uh, uh, Rosenblatt, working with his machine, which was actually an analog machine of sorts. Uh, it involved real wires. It wasn't a digital simulation of a, of a neural network, as most neural networks today are. It was an actual network of wires that you had to <laughs> pick through. Um, and and so uh, very soon Rosenblatt uh, presents this idea of a neural network, which he calls a perceptron. And this is supposed to both be a model of human cognition, which of course we have very good reason to believe proceeds through um, our own neural networks in our brains. Um, and at the same time, it's supposed to be an architecture that might lead to more effective artificial intelligence. In terms of its structure, Rosenblatt's perceptron is very similar to uh, Selfridge's pandemonium. We have an input layer, which is the sort of first step of taking data in or responding to data by this system. Then we have what Rosenblatt called an association layer, which is formed by um, is actually informed by random connections into this layer from the input layer. So that was an important point that Rosenblatt stressed that at least initially, the connections from the input layer to the association layer would be randomly assigned. And then the association layer feeds into or passes information to, <laughs> uh, sends signals to, I should say, the output layer. Now, much like Selfridge's megaphones, uh, in this case, we have weights on each of the connections, and then we have thresholds in each uh, neural unit. So in particular, in the middle layer there and in the final layer, in the output layer. And the thresholds determine, basically, it's, it's whether or not the signals coming in to the neuron are equal to or above its threshold that determine whether or not it sends a signal to the next layer. Okay, and so this the first neuron in the association layer here, which has a threshold of four, is only going to fire, it's only going to send an on signal to the output layer if both the three, three weighted and the two weighted signals coming into it uh, are active. Otherwise, it won't be at or above the four threshold and so it won't fire. The idea um, also though, and Rosenblatt built this into his into the models conceptually, is that each of these neural elements is just going to sing, send a single signal down the chain. So they're either on or off. It's not that 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 uh, apart I mean the weights magnify <laughs> the Im the import of the firing but the firing is just an on or off matter. So the, the, the first neuron here in the association layer, the one with the threshold of four, it either fires or doesn't fire. And when it fires, it sends a signal that is amplified by five to the output layer. Note also that the output layer here is just one neuron. So the information content that can be in the output, at least in this, in this perceptron, in this diagram of the perceptron, is uh, the information content is just a one or a zero, basically. So, it, you know, this would be could be a system that decides whether some image is a circle or is not a circle. Um, in which case, you know, the the last node we would want the last node to fire if the image is a circle, and to not fire if the image is not a circle. One of the really impressive things that that Rosenblatt des described and developed here was something called an error correction procedure or the error correction procedure, which basically involved 
um, using the successfulness or not of the classifications by the perceptron to change the weights of the neural connections so that if the uh, perceptron were, were used again, it would classify correctly. So it's basically using information about the success or failure of a perceptron to inform the next generation of that perceptron. That is, to inform how the weights should be adjusted um, in order to be more accurate. And so you see here I've expressed basically the relation between the on or off state of those three neurons in the middle x1, x2, and x3, That's the that will, each of those x's will equal a 1 or a 0, depending on whether the neuron is on or off. And uh, the, the uh, weights of each of those connections feeding into the last neuron, the neuron in the outer layer. A connection between these uh, on-off states and the weights and the threshold value. And so that equation describes a certain relation between the, um, the weights, the activation states of the prior layer neurons, and the activation or non-activation of the output layer neuron. And the same equation can be used for describing the inputs and outputs of any neuron in the system, actually, uh, from the association layer forward. And so what this, what this allows us to do then is to think about the program as a classifying program that's describing a, what, what can be called, what is called a hyperplane, which divides up space, in this case, three-dimensional space, but it could be any dimensional space. I mean, if the middle layer here had six neurons, this could be a six-dimensional space. That's very hard to represent and conceptualize, but it can be described mathematically. And um, this error correction procedure basically operated as follows, that for all of the inputs that the perceptron classified incorrectly, all the cases where its output was incorrect, where say it said that something that was not a circle was a circle, or it said that something was a circle was not a circle. In each of those cases, the weights can be adjusted so that the threshold value is in the right place for that particular set of activations. Okay, And so um, the weights can be used to, to the, that is, changes in the weights can be used to sculpt this system to the state where it can accurately classify any set of data. Now, I should be careful about that because it has been mathematically demonstrated that if there is a hyperplane that, that divides up the cases into those that, uh, those that are an instance of something and those that are not, if there actually is a hyperplane that can be described, then this error correction procedure that I've just uh, mentioned can be used to find it. But in some cases, there might not be such a hyperplane. It might not actually be possible to uh, capture the, the difference um, in, the, uh, in the training, in the, in, the, in the set of data. It might not be possible to capture that difference with an equation. Now, in the subsequent years of development of the perceptron and similar systems, neural network, artificial neural networks more generally, there have been a number of variations on this model. And we will look at some of them in, in a lot more detail um, relatively soon. But one thing to notice is that the system displayed here is a series coupled or feed forward network because the only signals that are, are sent from one neuron to another uh, are just sent in one direction. The input layer always sends the association layer, not vice versa. The associ association layer always sends the output layer, not vice versa. None of the later layers send information back to earlier layers, and none of the layers have connections between neurons in the same layer. And those two alternatives, basically connections within the same layer or connections backwards, 
um, through layers are called cross-coupled and back-coupled networks or recurrent neural networks respectively. And there are certain advantages of building systems like that. There are also certain um, risks in terms of having an architecture that gets you the results that you want. Another variation is in how many nodes there are in each layer. Of course, we've just picked out four in the first, four in the second, one in the output, but it could be really any number of nodes in any of the layers. And one thing that that can be very beneficial for is in the output. If you want an output that's more nuanced than just yes or no. Likewise, you have the question of how many layers there are. And this becomes very important for what's later called deep learning. The deep part of deep learning comes from there being multiple layers uh, on the inside of the neural network. Most of the, of, of the perceptrons that Rosenblatt considered, most of his discussion of the perceptron, focused on perceptrons really with just one inner layer, one association layer. But at some point in the development of neural networks, people came to realize that there's a there are some things that you can do very well if you have multiple inner layers and you can't really do it at all if you just have one or two inner layers likewise there are some variants on the error correction procedure that allow a wider range of problems to be solved that is they allow, they allow for optimization in, even in cases where the error correction procedure described by Rosenblatt wouldn't, uh, wouldn't actually work.